I can't tell you what a treat it's been to have the last hour together. I am very, very conscious of the fact that uh, there's only one guru on the stage. I wouldn't agree with him. He has taught so many people. He's definitely a guru. Whether or not the teaching of transcendental meditation, bringing that into the public schools, violated the American principle of separation of church and state. Religion divides, spirituality unites. It's like banana and the banana skin. Spirituality is the banana and the religion is the banana skin. Though it comes with the skin, you don't eat the skin. Unfortunately, people throw the banana away and holding on to the skin and that's why we see so much conflict around the world. <laughs> How did you come to the insight and to ryth rhythmic breathing? When you write a poem, if you ask him, How did you write this beautiful poem? Say, well, just, I don't know. It just happened. So, I can't tell you what a treat it's been to have the last hour together and to find out that uh, folks that come from such different vantage points can have, have so much overlap in the Venn diagrams of the important things in life. Uh, I am very, very conscious of the fact that uh, there's only one guru on the stage <laughs> and that I am 5% uh, of the attraction of this evening. Uh, uh, it, now, it, it, but, but for those of you, and I, I think I do bring one advantage slash disadvantage to the conversation, and that is my sense is that there are a great many people, certainly in the world, and uh, probably a good majority of the people in this room who are disciples and have benefited so much from you. I come to this conversation, uh, yes, as a student of religion going back uh, more than 60 years, uh, but as a, a Roman Catholic, as a person of spirituality, uh, so from a very different vantage point, and I think that uh, that 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 has disadvantages, but it has the benefit maybe of bringing questions in from a different angle. I just want to say it's really daunting to re be responsible for an hour-long conversation with a person who's deeply committed to silence. <laughs> I mean, just think about that for a second. <laughs> but, but you promised me you, you're, you're not in a deep meditative state right now. <laughs> First of all, I wouldn't agree with him. He's only one guru. He's a maha guru. Because he has taught so many people, you know. And that warm hug he has given to all the nervous student has proved that uh, he's definitely a guru. <laughs> Thank you for that. I, so, I want to point out, if I could, that Faye graduated in 1991, and since 2006, I've only given hugs to people who have given me permission to give them a hug. <laughs> 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 At graduation, if the students want a hug, they had to pull their right <laughs> earlobe. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. <laughs> should we begin? Yeah, please. All right, so I... I uh, this is completely unrehearsed and spontaneous, and Gurudev has no idea of uh, the eclectic interests I have. So uh, he knows only that uh, I have eight questions because it must be divisible by four because my late wife's name was divisible by four <coughs> letters. Um, and whether we get to eight or not, uh, we don't know because I'm going to be very very sure to open it up for questions for you with time left for questions from a group that uh, deserves to have that time. But now here we get a sense of uh, some of the strange serendipity that unites us. I, I, I think the first time that I taught at a small Catholic college in Brooklyn, the Bhagavad Gita is 60 years ago now. This is the first time I entered your world. Uh, but he has no idea of this. But when, when I really entered your world, it was 1977, when uh, a great judge by the name of Arlen Adams, who, again, in the coincidences of life, uh, 
on Monday, I was asked to have coffee with a young scholar, and she was Arlen Adams' granddaughter. But a great judge named Arlen Adams decided a case on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals in which the question was whether or not the teaching of transcendental meditation then being offered by the Maharishi Mahesh Yoga, with whom you studied, whether bringing that into the public schools of the United States violated the American principle of separation of church and state. Notwithstanding the fact that a priest, a rabbi, and a minister had said, we want it taught. And the Maharishi said, Transcendental meditation is, is not a religion for these purposes. Judge Adams decided that it was. And that prompted me to write an article in the Harvard Law Review on defining religion in the First Amendment religion clauses, which is still being debated today, in which I argued that TM sometimes was a religion and sometimes wasn't a religion. But for purposes of the United States Constitution, it shouldn't be viewed of as a religion, and it should be allowed to be taught in the public schools. What's your view on this? Uh, uh, every religion has got three aspects. One is the practices, belief system, and then symbols. While the symbols and practices are different, but the values, underlying values among all the religions, you find that common uh, thread, like compassion, like being happy, being stress-free. These values, I would say, are most vital. They are spiritual values. So while religion divides, spirituality unites. See, there was only one Jesus. Today you have 72 denominations of Christianity. There was only one prophet, Muhammad. And if you go uh, into Islam, there are 134 uh, sects of Islam. Buddhism was only Lord Gautam Buddha. And today you have 36 sects of Buddhism. In Hinduism, you can't even count. <laughs> it goes beyond the numbers. So, and each one claiming their way is the way, the only way, or the way to heaven. Now, this is an issue. This is the problem. As you were, we were sp speaking, um, you know, we said about the ecumenical view of religion is so essential that we have seen in this century. It was not there much before. But that type of uh, understanding is essential. Religion has its place, but spirituality is something which is common. For example, Ayurveda has come out of uh, Hinduism. Yoga has come out of Hinduism. But yoga will work on everybody. It doesn't require a belief system. It's a common practice. Uh, in fact, I say, if you watch a baby from the time it's born to the age of three, it does all the yoga postures. So a baby could be a great yoga teacher to you. So like yoga, meditation, they are very secular. Though their origin may be from religion. Yunani medicine has come from Islam. But medicine works for everybody. Like you see that. So we must see that where we should uh, see it as religion. Because in religion, it's, it's the way you are, your life is, your birth and your name and it... Uh, it is connected with the ceremonies you do, how you get married and what vows you take and how you are cremated when you die. These are all a part of religion. But living life in its value, seeing your, uh, your mind, your spirit, whether it's happy, are we moving in a happier uh, direction? Are we able to leave the potential, the ideals that we uh, imagine or sometimes we, uh, we aspire for, is it coming into our life? That I would call a spirituality, make a difference. For a layman, I would say um, it's like banana and the banana skin. 
<laughs> Spirituality is the banana and the religion is the banana skin. Though it comes with the skin, you don't eat the skin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? But unfortunately, people throw the banana away and holding on to the skin and that's why we see so much conflict around the world. Oh, I, I, I say these words uh, from my tradition, but God bless you. <laughs> uh, that, that, that is, that's... It's so insightful, and it reminds me, my, my mentor for my doctoral dissertation in religion, I have a PhD in religion. People at NYU think of me as an academic lawyer, but my first doctorate was in religion. And when I encountered him in 1962 for the first time, he was the world's leading expert on a medieval theologian of the Christian church. By the time I got to NYU Law School, he had edited a 60-volume work on on spirituality which had 25 faith traditions in it so this core that this core that gurudev has highlighted of the the spiritual essence of religion uh, now that runs against i'm going to now tell a story and i want you to react to it through a particular question in 1956 in a classroom in Brooklyn, New York, at a great school, a great Jesuit high school, a Jesuit priest by the name of Daniel Berrigan, who later became one of the leaders of the peace movement. So this was not some troglodyte. This was a progressive thinking man. He wrote on the blackboard in that classroom four Latin words. It's a Catholic school. Extra ecclesia nulla salis. Outside the church, there's no salvation. And I went up to him, even as a 12-year-old, I, I, there was something I sensed of your spirit in me, I guess. And I went up and I said, Father Berrigan, does that mean my best friend, Jerry Epstein, who's Jewish, can't go to heaven? And Danny Berrigan said to me in 1956, John, if you don't baptize him, he will not go to heaven. Now, it turns out in retrospect that that 1956 comment has triggered most of my professional life as I've worked through various kinds of triumphalism, not the least is religious triumphalism. So when I got to writing a book about spirituality, my baseball as a road to God book, I fought really hard. They kept changing the title to baseball as the road to God. <laughs> and I said, no, it's baseball as a road to God. Uh, what causes, I mean, you just, you, you highlighted it in your answer, but be more, uh, come more to us. What causes humans to use the spiritual to divide each other? And a related question, what causes them to try to intellectualize something in doctrine and dogma? Is it all about people just trying to have power? Or is there something more innate? I think it's prejudice. We grow up with a lot of prejudice. The need to have another? Uh, yeah. The one up and show. A uh, sense of prejudice, you know, that's not. And fear. Fear, guilt, and prejudice. These three things, you know, uh, we get ingrained in them. I, I ask a simple question. See, uh, down the lane here, you have Chinese restaurant. You go, when you want to have Chinese food, you go and have Chinese food. Just by eating Chinese food, you don't turn to be Chinese. <laughs> so you eat Danish cookies, <laughs> and you have Swiss chocolates. So when it comes to food, we accept food from all over the world. When it comes to clothing, yeah, then also see people wear clothes from all over the place. You know, you get fur coats from uh, Scotland and people wear from uh, dresses from Mexico. So when it comes to food, music and uh, clothing and all that, even politics, we accept these things from all over the world. But when it comes to philosophy, religion, why do we close ourselves down? That Then we are making ourselves uh, very rigid and poorer in some sense, that you are not uh, broad-minded. You, you miss the wisdom. See, someone who misses the wisdom of uh, Jesus Christ or, say, Buddha or Lao Tzu, 
they miss a lot. So I would say that we must uh, globalize wisdom. You should be able to, and you follow your path. If you are a Catholic, be a Catholic, devote Catholic. But you don't have to say, you know, I cannot read something else, otherwise I will go to hell. Yeah. That fear and guilt, we must be, we must do away with it. Yeah. And have that open mind, especially when you want to have an intellectual pursuit. Then, uh, as, as the ancient Rishi said, you know, let knowledge flow to us from all sides. The Rishis in India said, you know, that there is not one book in Hinduism per se. About 1,000 sages, they sat in deep meditation and whatever they downloaded it. And that's why it's called downloaded uh, scriptures. And then they put, and then they said, if you if your intellect accepts this, only then you take it. Put it into your, not that saying, because I'm saying you must accept it. No, the spirit of inquiry should be kept alive. Yes. That scientific temper should always be nurtured. You know, if your logic approves it, if your intellect takes it, only then you uh, you approve it. You know. But but at base, and it's interesting because in each of the highly intellectualized religions, you'll find this statement. And of course, the religions that are much more experiential don't need it. At base, the spiritual is ineffable. It's, it's incapable of being put into words. So it's a fool's errand to try to reduce it to doctrine and dogma. Uh, let, let, me, let, let me move on. And I, uh, one more kind of generic question before we move into some of your specific uh, thoughts about happiness in life. Uh, I'm going to read a quote. No, please. Not from you, <laughs> uh, but from a great... Christian theologian by the name of Paul Tillich. It's one of my favorite uh, quotes from him. And he's speaking about this word, God. A and he says, the name of this infinite and inexhaustible depth and ground of all being is God. That depth is what God means. And if the word God has not much meaning for you, translate it and speak of the depths of your life, of the source of your being, of your ultimate concern, of what you take seriously without any reservation. Perhaps in order to do so, you have to forget everything traditional that you've learned about God, perhaps even the word itself. So that's Tillich. If you were putting that in one of your writings or speeches. How would you edit it? No, that's one way. This is one idea about God. It's still an idea. See, the experience of love is different from a lecture or talk on love. See, I always say to people, <laughs> Lisa and I didn't reason each other to the fact that we had total love for each other. I, thou, yeah. love. And you can't explain it. You can't explain you can't it. Explain the person it. doesn't have it. And why do you have to define everything? Yeah. <laughs> we are in the run to define everything and understand, put it in this the boxes. This is this intellectualization. In our, in our head. <laughs> yeah. So just be, just life be, you know. And, and life is divine, divine. You know, life is part of the divinity. Honoring life, uh, you know, recognizing that love is there in everyone, even in those whom we condemn as criminals. Yeah. If you really look into them, there is that childlike innocence that's hiding inside them. A child is hiding inside them too, and that is godliness. And, and this is something, uh, even Aristotle spoke of experiential knowledge. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like Stephen Jay Gould said, science and uh, religion are two different magisteria when it's defined the way you're defining it. All right, last self-indulgence, and this is for my dear friend, Chantrika Tandon, who uh, uh, saw in our conversation inside a, a contrast that she had to confess and apologize was not there. So on June the 27th, 
my family and I, as we were discussing, uh, will go into the Grand Canyon. We do this whenever anybody in the family reaches the age of 12, and we spend a minimum of nine days in the Grand Canyon. And uh, this time it'll be 17 days, because it's for my 80th birthday. And by day two or three, if any of you have done serious, I mean, you're completely incommunicado. You're a mile deep in the earth. There's the life above the rim is completely unknown to you. And there's a phenomena that's called canyon time. And by the second or third time a day, you're in canyon time or river time. And you can feel it biologically and spiritually and... Uh, um, What's the connection between what I will be experiencing during those 17 days and, and uh, your book, Celebrating Silence? <laughs> See, this was my fear. <laughs> I don't think it's such an intelligent thing to talk about silence. <laughs> Rather, it's an oxymoron. See, we convey a lot through our vibrations. You know, uh, more, more effectively, more so through our vibration than our words. But words are essential. I would say words are like the icing on the cake. But the real thing is the cake itself. You know, you can't just have only icing and uh, enjoy them. Simple things, see, when people greet you, say, have a nice day. Someone on the street says, have a nice day. But when the same have a nice day comes to you from someone very close to you, maybe your grandmother, your mother or some, it carries certain vibrations. You see? Now, when John speaks, and he's speaking from a space where he really believes in it and he's living in it, then that has an impact. Right? So I feel that the silence gives us the depth to our words. It gives more meaning to our words and it makes our life richer. And nature has made it like that. See, every night we go to sleep, and some people even talk during sleep. <laughs> That's a different. So when we sleep, and that energizes our whole energy, brings that refreshing. Um, you know, feeling within us. And then we are able to think, feel, and express. So silence is very important to express ourselves um, and also perceive what's happening around us. Mm. So how did you come to the insight and to ryth rhythmic breathing uh, and how, how would you, I mean, 80% of the world here knows this, but uh, for example, my, 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 my longtime friend, Pat Foy, who you know, comes from running the subways, for God's sake, he's, he's a Catholic kid that I've known since he was in high school. He has no idea about rhythmic breathing at all. You know, he hyperventilates most of the time. <laughs> uh, so how would you explain how you came to this tremendous insight that's been so important. Uh, how would you explain it to somebody that comes out of a dogmatic Abrahamic religion like I do and like Pat does? Uh, how did I come out of this? Yes, Is that what you yes, asking? yes. Well, you know, when you write a poem, if you ask him, how did you write this beautiful poem? You say, well, just, I don't know. It just happened. Huh? <laughs> it now just you're happened. talking like the Beatles. <laughs> 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 it just happened. It just... You know, I was uh, in the nature. I was teaching already some meditation practices and yoga. And, uh, but then I felt there's something um, that's not complete. I need to bring out something. Then it just happened. Yeah. It's like I didn't make a, an exercise or manipulate. You weren't thing sitting there straining <laughs> no, to no. figure out. No, you know, no, no. And, and there was no vision <laughs> no. or anything like, like that. No, it was just like a poem that just, like a gift, it just came to me. Now, I understand the oxymoronic 
nature of the question I'm asking, uh, and you very deftly avoided editing till I, 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 so I'm not as dumb as you think I am. <laughs> uh, yeah, but but uh, how do you, how, you know, here I am. Okay, now I've read, but Pat hasn't. Pat's probably the only person in the room who came because of me tonight, okay? How would you explain to him what this is? How, how would you introduce him to him and turn him into a person like, the, the, I mean, you talk about coincidences, like, like the woman I had lunch with today who just spent 14 yeah. days yeah. in one of your uh, You know, you, you don't have to go to Canyon or you don't have to go somewhere uh, to take time off. What you, all that you need to do is learn about your own patterns in the breath. So when you're happy, how do you breathe? When you're unhappy, what is the rhythm in your breath that's going on? So if you take a little bit time to learn about your breath, you learn a lot about your mind. I would say this is like mental hygiene, like dental hygiene. You know, if you go to Masai Mara, you will find half of their teeth in all different shapes and forms. And then half of them will not be there at all. So because they were never taught dental hygiene, the tribes I'm talking about in Masai Mara. But we know, because in civilized society, we know we had to brush our teeth. Even when we were saying no, our mom would say, come on, brush your teeth, and that's good for you. Like that, we have not been taught how to handle our mind. Our mind oscillates between past and future, and we do not know how to get rid of a negative feeling that we get. You know, it's common to get stressed. It's normal to get stressed. We know that. But to get out of stress also, we need techniques, tools and techniques, which were never available for us, neither in school nor at home, anyone taught us. If you are upset, how to come out of it? But the secret is breath, because every rhythm of the breath has a definite pattern of emotions attached to it. So if you directly, you cannot uh, change your moods, your mind, but you can do through your breath. You can go to theat any theatrical uh, college, a school, they'll teach you. If you have to express anger, how you have to breathe. And if you have to express a uh, sort of serenity and what type of uh, pattern of breath you might adopt. And if you have to show uh, valor, you have to come up with a different breathing pattern. You can't say, ah, like that and say, I'm expressing anger. No. So our emotions are connected with the rhythms of the breath. This has gone out of sight, fortunately or unfortunately, that people are not uh, being aware of this. This is where I thought, you know, this is some education we have to bring to the population. So we taught in the prisons. Uh, we have taught in about 800,000 prisoners have learned. When they do the breathing, they suddenly feel, Oh my God, so much of anger, hatred, I was uh, harboring within me. Now it's all gone. Now I feel lighter, you know. I feel um, psychologically very uh, centered and sane. This is what uh, the work of breath work is and it helps also meditation. See, sometimes you say, I want to meditate and sit with eyes closed and so many thoughts bombard your mind, you're unable to uh, be silent, but with the help of breathing technique, it becomes much easier. Yeah. So, so far, we, we've we highlighted that, that part of your teaching, which is experiential and gets to a very deep, ineffable place. But I, I've been struck in following you over the years uh, that you, you, you also use the bully pulpit that you have and you go out and speak and use words uh maybe not as much as i speak and use words but and and much more eloquently i was really uh, interested and got to encounter your work in this area because uh, my wife's brother who lived with us for the first eight years of our marriage is the ambassador to Colombia for the United States. And so I saw your work in Colombia and Venezuela. Um, I was struck by your climate change talk uh, on Earth Day. Could you connect that? Because that's a very practical 
yeah. thing that you spoke of. Connect that to the the general spirit of what you've been saying so far, because there's another side of you that's out there talking on issues. Yeah, it's just a matter of creating awareness, uh, you know, that we have one planet Earth, we have to safeguard it. Because the environment is our first body. It's an extension of our body. You know, what you see today in the shops, in the, on the shelves tomorrow, when you eat them, they become part of your body. We came into this planet, just we were what? Five, pound, five kilos, eight pounds, 10 pounds, nine pounds. And all that weight you have put on is, is all come from this planet Earth, right? We have, uh, we have grown here and this body depends on the environment totally. You can't say I'll care for my body, but for not the air quality, not the water. I don't worry about the water quality. No, you can't, you can't exist. So your existence depends on the environment. And so we must care for the environment. It must be our, our prime duty to care for that. You know? Rejuvenate rivers, uh, bodies. If there is any third world war, I would say it will be on water. The water scarcity in the world and the way we pollute water, we pollute oceans, are appalling. Same with Earth, you know, we put so many pesticides. In fact, our planet Earth is suffering from anemic. Uh, anemia. Uh, if, though we go with, grow vegetable fruits, the nutrition in it are very less. And so, I would say organic farming. You know, we have to educate people in organic farming and help everyone to plant more trees and be more sensitive to the environment. Yeah, when I go to the Grand Canyon which will be 60 years since the first time I went down into the canyon and did the river. The, the river will be at the lowest it's been in those 60 years. The, the, the dam that created Lake Powell, which was created in the late 1960s, is almost at the point where it, it, it's, I think, 27 feet more mm -hmm. of drop, and it will not be able to provide electricity. Uh, so the, 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 we, all of this is very palpable because that's the water for the whole Southwest, mm -hmm. that dam and Hoover Dam. Okay. I... No, this is this is happening world over. See here, like pandemic, we can't say we will save water only in America or India or Asia or somewhere. It's a global phenomenon unless mm -hmm. and until all the nations sign this treaty, they all come together, they work together to save the planet Earth. It's not going to happen, you know, B because we are, the boundaries are not known to the air, what the five elements of nature, you know, there is no difference between Canada and US and Mexico and these, the political boundaries are irrelevant when it comes to pandemic or resources of the planet. So we need to save the resources of the planet that that's a big responsibility. I'm glad that there is at least talk now happening. I've been talking about it for the last 40 years. So when I first began talking about saving the water on the ground and then the resources, people thought, hey, I must be speaking something out there, you know, mm -hmm. not so practical. And today there is a Ministry of Environment in the past two decades. You must... Uh, you must be, I mean, all of us must be aware that uh, 20 years back, 25 years back, there was no care for environment. Right. Today there is at least talk happening and people are being more conscious about it. So that's, we are, we are moving in the right direction, I think. In but this. your connection of it to a totality of being, which is us. Us, yeah. So, uh, just a, uh, an alert where, where this is my next to last question. This is a simple one, and, uh, and not simple in its profundity, I, I hope, but simple in that uh, it just calls on you for a reaction. And I have one final question to ask you, which is a little more complex, and then we'll get to the questions from you just about right on time. Um, 
how do you feel, you, the guru of love and compassion, when you hear the news of the pain in the world today and the atrocities that we witness every single day in the news reports and on television, how do you respond to that? Uh, it, just emotionally, how do you respond to it? I'm not asking you for, for a solution. Yeah. Uh, let me see. See, the word guru simply means guide or teacher. And uh, so for me, I'm a guru by accident. Because <laughs> 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 I keep spreading what I was, I knew, I keep sharing. And then, uh, in fact, everyone plays a role of a guru to me. Uh, every teacher is a guru, every mother is a uh, guru, you know, every friend, a real friend who helps someone uh, without expecting anything in return, not even a thanks, is a guru. Having said this, I would say, uh, when I consider the whole world as one family, we are all part of this one planet, any trouble anywhere definitely pinches, pains. It does. And instead of sitting and brooding over it, I jump into action. See, I, when I saw some things happening in Colombia, I said, let us immediately go there. So I went there. I spoke to President Santos. He said, there doesn't seem to be any hope. The talks have failed. I said, let me have a chance. Let me try. He said, yeah, welcome. Then I took a flight and went to Cuba. And I met the FARC rebels there. First, they were not ready to see me. So said, we have our um, Karl Marx as our mm. ideal, and then um, we will not meet anyone spiritual, <laughs> any guru that met. So then they came to check me out. I was giving a talk in um, University of Havana. So they came to check me out and heard me, did a meditation with me. <laughs> And then they agreed to talk to me. Even communists can meditate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they talked to me afterwards. Then, see, they all meditated. Yeah. And then they said, yeah, we will accept the Gandhian principle of nonviolence. And the peace talk resumed. And now they're in the government. Yeah, now they are in the government. Yeah. So uh, the, the last question is prompted by you, your uh, keynote just a short while ago of the Metaverse Summit. And in that keynote, you described metaverse as, quote, a language for a planet, close quote, that could produce, quote, a better place for a better generation free from stress, close quote. And when I read the talk that you gave, which was wonderful, and uh, got to know more and more about your teachings, and I'm more convinced of this after the 45 minutes or so we've spent. Um, it reminds me deeply of the most influential philosopher in my own life. Uh, remember, I'm, I had that encounter with Daniel Berrigan, but then the Vatican Council starts. John the 23rd says, open us. The, the, there are many facets to the diamond of insight. And on the Fordham campus, when I was getting first my bachelor's and then my PhD, there was Teilhard de Jardin. And Teilhard, for those that don't know him, was a paleontologist. He, he knew evolution. He embraced evolution, <coughs> biological evolution, at a time when the Catholic Church was resisting it. And he made a metaphor to theology and talked about planetization. And, and how in biology species emerge and then diverge into difference, but they then converge on some point omega, he called it, that produces a next level of existence that's better. And I really want to believe in the world that you and Teilhard describe. But my NYU colleague Jonathan Haidt has a terrific article in the most recent Atlantic about how with social media and the differences and so forth, we've armed each citizen with a dart. And social media just allows people in a Colosseum culture to throw darts. And if you step into the Colosseum, you'll be inundated with darts. In that world, in the world of the atrocities we see, 
give me hope. How can people that want to believe in the world you talk about hope? I know we have to continue fighting because if we stop fighting, then we definitely lose. That's Pascal's wager for me. Yeah. But, but am I a hopeful warrior or just uh, doing it out of dharma because it's my duty to, to battle? See, if you, uh, if you look around, uh, the people who are doing atrocities are a minority. But they are more active. The people with compassion are in majority on this planet. For example, now the Ukrainian refugees are there in Poland. And I was just in Poland and Germany and all these places. I met the Ukrainian refugees. The amount of love that has been poured in for them to, to house them, to feed them, to give them comfort is tremendous. So there is a lot more compassion on the planet. One thing I have observed is the people with negative tendencies, they are more proactive. The people with more positive mindset, they are a little bit laid back. Now this is why I started this campaign, I stand for peace. So instead of feeling a despondency, feeling hopeless, sitting at home, at least you do something, say I stand for peace. Invoke the valor within you that you can, you know, you can get over the crisis and you can work towards it. So in this context, using the word very differently, silence is complicity, right? Silence is not to be encouraged. <laughs> Stepping out. Silence and activity, they are complementary, though they are yes, opposite. Yes, yes. That's your life. Yes. Yes. They had to do both. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, now we turn to the questions I've been given. And uh, I think this is pretty good. It's yeah, 7, yeah, 747. Yeah. And they Fine. told us leave 10 <laughs> minutes. I'm leaving an extra three. So there. Uh, what makes a man or woman a humanitarian as opposed to a benevolent politician? Uh, pardon, can you repeat the question? What makes a man or woman a humanitarian? We described you, and uh -huh. I would affirm you are a humanitarian, as opposed to a benevolent politician. Well, these are different hats. A politician <laughs> can be humanitarian. But usually humanitarians are not politicians. <laughs> Anything else you want to say on that? <laughs> I think I think it's a good answer. I'd give it an A, not an A plus, but an A. Uh, uh, okay. All right. Here's a great angle because I certainly don't qualify for the protasis to this sentence. As someone from the younger generation, I'm young in spirit. What are some Me things? <laughs> some things or mistakes you see that young people make and how would you advise me to avoid them? Well, uh, you know, your advices are not taken if there is no trust. I have no sense of belongingness. If that is established, that you feel a sense of belongingness and they do, from both sides. You understand why someone is doing wrong things. Then there is a chance for them to turn around. Otherwise, it's not possible. Let me ask a, a follow-up to that. There, there seems to me to be an, a pandemic of mistrust in the world now. Some polling shows that 85% of Americans don't trust their neighbors. And in my lifetime, I've seen our trust for the government and our churches and our corporations just dissipate. And trust in themselves also low. Yes. In oneself. They don't trust themselves. They don't trust others. That is what is insecurity is all about. Yes, that word insecurity. The insecurity. Yeah. You know, I see it. The, a group of uh, my class last semester at the law school was 90 students. Uh, eight of them were PhDs. 
Uh, one of them was the person who invented Dropbox. And uh, I have a very pastoral way of, of, of teaching, and they'll come in for pastoral advice. Uh, I would say 90% of the women and 40% of the men had what I would call imposter syndrome. Mm. They didn't think they belonged. Mm. And there's some connection, I think, between not trusting themselves, trusting not thinking themselves. they belong, then fail. They, 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 I, I, a young woman asked me today, uh, what do you think is, it was a, a freshman in high school interviewing me for her freshman newspaper. I don't know how young this person is. And she, and she said, what well, was a similar question? I said, you people plan too much and you're afraid to fail. fail yeah. I have a 2.1 college grade point average. Okay, my son and daughter took my transcript to college with them because they could always get a higher grades than me. <laughs> they would read me my grades first. But I learned that this life after failure, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. all of this is part of one ball. Am I right about that or, or uh, am I missing something? No, 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 absolutely. See, um, the trust in oneself is weak so you don't trust others. For all this, we need some silence, some meditation. See, if they take a few days of retreat or just go into silence, even three days, four days, when the stress is out of the system, you, bring, you get clarity in the mind. And, you know, and that clarity can bring uh, trust back again. See, trust it's, is our nature. See, you look at small children, babies, they have so much trust. They go around. Absolute trust. Have, there's so much trust. So that, that element of trust is already within us. Mm. But it's because of stress and lack of, uh, um, you know, um, broader mindset that, that makes it. Yeah. I use with my students a metaphor to a dartboard uh, to teach them the Confucian version of this, which is, you, you know, you start with the inner circle. Mm your own self, your Tao, Yourself. and then you work out to your family. And don't try to change the world <laughs> until you get it straightened out here. And, when you, when you when get enough self-awareness as you have, then you can try to change the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, one more thing is this, we must understand doubt before we even think about trust. We get doubts, but we don't know, understand doubt itself. Doubt is always about something that is negative, uh, yeah. something that is always positive. Uh, pardon me. So when you say, I love you so much, you ask them, really? You don't say, I'm, I'm mad at you. People take it for granted. The dishonesty of a person, you, are, you take it for granted. But if the honesty of a person, we doubt. Yeah. So the doubt is always about something that is positive. If we can understand this, you know, uh, the whole reversal happens there. Mm -hmm. And get back to your... A true original self. Yeah. This is a specific question, but I sense important to the person, and maybe you can provide some enlightenment. So, Gurdiv, how can we heal and improve interfaith relations in India? How can we reduce the hate against the minority religions? I'm thinking on these lines only, and that's why we keep traveling and bringing communities together, having more programs, bringing, bringing people together, you see, of different faiths and different cultures or different languages. If you see, actually, it is not on the grassroots level. This is just a few uh, people for their own personal agenda. See here our agenda. discussion on power. Uh, doctrine and power, right? Uh, for their own personal agenda, they create these sort of uh, conflicts. If you go to the ground level, see, we had this 500-year-old conflict, temple conflict, temple and mosque conflict. And I was, the Supreme Court appointed me to, um, as one of the judge, to resolve that. I was, I had nothing to do with the law, actually. I have not studied any law or anything, no degree in law, but they insisted I be on the panel. And then, you know, I met uh, people from both faiths, Hinduism and then Islam. And this 
year old problem which would erupt every time there is an election was resolved amicably there is not a single um, disturbance once this uh, uh, you know arrangement we came into so that that's all about communication and the ground level you will see these differences are not there people have been living together of different faiths from so long but you know some elements cause from both sides for their personal gain they they rake up the issues which are non issue yeah. um my uh, my Guru Dev and I were speaking about this before because he's going to come to visit NYU Abu Dhabi, which is my dream school, and brings students from around the world. And for NYU Abu Dhabi students, won an international competition, and President, former President Clinton, was preventing them, presenting them with the prize. And the four students were from India, Pakistan, Taiwan, and mainland China. And President Clinton turned to them and said, uh, are you sure you want this picture taken to be put in your local newspapers? And they're, 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 these college students said, that's just for the politicians. It's not us. We're roommates. Yeah. So, question. How has the pandemic changed the working of the world? Uh, has it, how can we, we help use it to create coming out of it. I mean, I could say, for example, now that I have mastered Zoom for teaching, okay, I will never teach without Zoom again. Now I will do what I'm doing this week, which is I will do my Friday class with my NYU Abu Dhabi students by Zoom, setting up my Tuesday class in Abu Dhabi with them. So I'm good. So, I, I mean, this is a powerful, the pandemic has kind of forced different ways of thinking about work-life balance and all. You see, technology has saved us in the pandemic in some way. Because yeah. of Zoom, we could communicate, we could work. Uh, I mean, thanks to technology, it has, uh, it has really, you know, uh, saved our planet from a bigger disaster, I would say. But at the same time, I think we should not be addicted to anything, anyone thing. If you say, I can only do in Zoom or I can only do uh, in the real time, online, offline, we must uh, have a combination of everything. Yeah. And life is that uh, like that, you know, I should take everything on, move on. Because, see, when you, when you sit with John, it's a separate joy. Rather than seeing John on the Zoom, you know, Zoom. Yeah. because so much is <laughs> that in... we can leave it for the future generation. Now, when yeah. we are here, we yeah. must. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I'm sure this is true of those that have encountered you. It's certainly been my experience in the last couple of hours. What doesn't come through Zoom is seeing the person through their eyes. You know, and uh, seeing you through your eyes. As a guy from Brooklyn, we see people through their eyes, you know. Uh, so I, I'm, I, I've got a couple more questions here. I'm sorry if I don't get to all of them. They were all great. But if, if happiness is our true nature, why do we get entangled in happenings and lose our happiness? Well, you have not realized it is your nature. The moment it comes to your experience, it is your nature, you, you don't lose it. You think you have lost it, you have not. Just It just gets covered, that's all. It's like uh, someone who is suffering from insomnia, you tell them, oh, sleeping is natural. They'll say, what are you talking about? You know, I'm tossing and turning all night, I couldn't sleep. And you say, sleeping is natural. Oh, yeah, my dear, yes, it is. Just get, uh, you know, just get a little bit treatment about that, you know, breathe, breathe a little bit, you'll have a good sleep. This is related in a way. Uh, how does a person manage or handle their ego, and the person wrote ego in big letters? Uh, 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 why do we fear? How do we overcome fear? So, first of all, what is your definition of ego? Ego is some identity, I am somebody. Let it be. See, you identify yourself, I am intelligent or I am not so intelligent. Ego can be both ways, you see. It's not that oh, I am 
the most uh, learned or I don't know anything, I am stupid. This is all identity, isn't it? Your identity is your ego. You, you say, I am very rich or I am very poor, I am wise or I am totally um, a black spot, a black sheep. This type of identity we hold on to and we say this is our ego and we try to get rid of them, this is even bigger problem. Just be natural. The antidote for ego is just being natural. Feel one with everybody. Be natural. Say, as a child, what were you? You were not holding on to, I am somebody. You know, you were just mixing with everybody. There was some lightness to you. And why we want to get rid of ego? Because it pinches us, it pains us a lot. That separation, we build a wall between us and others. We think, we want to show differently to others than what we are not, than what we are. So that tendency can be nullified by being natural. Now, never try to get rid of your ego. If you find you have one, keep it in your pocket. But don't show it all the time. <laughs> don't show it out all the time. Keep it with you. If you could get rid of ego, that's the biggest ego, I tell you. I got rid of my ego, could be the <laughs> biggest ego. So, I would say, never bother about ego, just keep it. Keep it with you. Yeah, what do you say? Yes, I, I think, uh, to put this in Brooklyn, to translate into that language, and to, to just uh, close, uh, by going back to the canyon and the 300 miles my family will go. Or if you want to tonight's basketball games where any good basketball coach says to the team, and all three sentences, go with the flow. Go with the flow. Go with the flow. Just <laughs> go with the flow. Well, we went with the flow for a, an hour and two minutes, but I think <laughs> Faye gave a very long introduction, so. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I think that stole. We would have been right on the clock. I think yeah. you know. Yeah. And and in any way, this has been an, a, a kind of atemporal experience. But I just have to say to you, thank you for being the force in the world that you are. And please continue to give those of us who yearn for the world you envision or Teilhard envisioned. Please continue to give us the hope that your eyes give us. Please, let's say thank you. Thank you, John. You keep blessing the world and have more ways to God, like the basketball. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> thank you, everybody.